<laughs> okay, um, so you're at the panel, um, the left voice panel, shut it down, black struggle, class struggle. To let everyone know, we are filming here, we are recording, and um, just some housekeeping stuff. The restrooms, if you haven't found them, they're down the hall and to the right. Stuff happens, so, you know, and I know some folks have had issues finding room, so now you know where the restroom is. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are Left Voice. We have some magazines here. One in particular is about Baltimore a year after the rebellion. There are uh, international news that we're discussing, Brazil, Cuba, Argentina, Bernie Sanders, a lot of different other relevant current and international issues. Left Voice is an international socialist press. We are collaborating with um, the organization that was started in Latin America called La Izquierda Diario. And uh, some of our contributions are written by people in the United States as well as international contributions from all over the world. So it really is an international press and it's written as such. So the panel you're here today for is called Shut It Down, Black Struggle, <coughs> Class Struggle. And the purpose of this panel is to discuss um, several different issues. One in particular uh, that's so important is this revitalization of the black liberation movement and black people in the political movement. It never stopped, but it certainly was crushed, repressed, people murdered, jailed, disappeared intentionally by the government and other racist bigots. And that was a, this was a period that people had to survive through and a lot of a lower level of political activity. And now, because of capitalism's repressive, exploitative nature, the racist ideological underpinnings of this system, we see a resurgence of youth, of women, queer, LGBT people standing up and shutting it down. And so how have people been shutting it down? What does that mean? That's a rallying cry I'm sure a lot of us all around the country have heard, shut it down. People have been shutting down freeways, they've been shutting down transportation centers. I'm from Los Angeles, we shut down the Metrolink, we shut down the freeway several times. The bridges here, the toll booths here, different things have been shut down in terms of transportation, disrupting the flow of capital. But also, the other aspect of shutting it down has been shutting down and making it impossible to be apathetic towards the racist nature of this system and the murder of black people by law enforcement and racist bigots. It's impossible to, to have no opinion. Whereas before, some people said they weren't sure. Now, either you're with the cops or you're with black people. And people have had to make a decision. The other thing, or the other aspect of shutting it down has also been shutting down the former kind of ways that people have been organizing, challenging that. And in particular, in Ferguson, where they shut down a lot of the self-appointed leaders of different communities and said, no, you don't represent us. We didn't ask for you here. You don't speak for us. And people who have put themselves forward as being representatives, when in reality, they're part of the po main political establishment. And furthermore, it's also shut down a lot of the other forms of organizing. That if we're talking about black liberation, we're also talking about black women's liberation. We're also talking about qu black queer liberation. We're talking about black disabled people. We're talking about those things and all encompassing, which some other movements in the past haven't been as encompassing. And the leaders of these movements have been women. They have been LGBT people. They have been people. But one other part that hasn't been talked about as much has been the power that we have as working people. The power that we have to shut this system down, not just in a boycott, not just in a march, but also economically in the form of a strike, also economically in the form of organizing in our workplaces. Um, and many of us haven't even thought of ourselves as workers. Even though we've seen ourselves as oppressed people, we haven't considered that even at our workplace, we have the economic power to shut this system down. And so that's what we'd like to kind of talk about here with some of our panelists. 
We have two amazing panelists here that I'm so excited and nervous to be on the podium with, uh, <laughs> but proud to be, to, be stand, to be standing here with in solidarity. So um, I'd like to you know, first say some things about both of our panelists and then introduce them. Ben Woods is a contributor for Black Agenda Report. Um, he's an amazing speaker and writer. He's also an organizer in Washington, D.C., and I'll let him talk about some of the projects he's working on. We also have Dan Georgiakis, who's wrote Detroit, I Do Mind Dying, which is an amazing book and very influential about the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement in particular in Detroit. And he also has some of his books there at uh, Haymarket Press. Um, so for folks, that you can read that. And Ben Woods', ben Woods works is also located on Black Agenda Report. So I'd like to welcome up Ben Woods to speak about some of the work that he's been doing and also his organizing with race and class. Ben Woods. All right, good, after, good evening. Uh, Excuse me. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. There you go. There you go. Okay, so um, Julia asked me to be a part of the panel. Um, she, there was an article I wrote for Black Agenda Report more recently Oh, uh, I guess about a little over a month ago, almost two months, called Class Struggle and National Liberation in the Movement for Black Lives. Um, for a few years, I guess quite a few, I've been, 10 years at least plus, I've been engaged in work around mass incarceration and political prisoners, but also more recently, well, past few years as well, police violence, particularly in Washington, D.C. area, more recently. And uh, so I wanted to kind of give an analysis of the current kind of movement for black lives and just uh, some and uh, sort of strategies, possible strategies for it in the future. So analysis of where it is, where you think it can go, ideas that I feel like may be missing from it or something that it can build on. So I'm gonna kind of go through that. Uh, a lot of the ideas I had when I, when I wrote it, I dedicated to um, Kwame Nkrumah, one of the great Pan-Africanists that was a uh, leader in Ghana and one of the great African nationalists of the independence movements and Jaleel Munta Kim, who was a political prisoner in New York, been a, since for over 40 years. So a lot of the ideas I had taken from them, as well as uh, some of my own, and just looking at the current conditions. So in response to the, the article I wrote was really dealing with um, in the year anniversary of Baltimore. So something about Baltimore, the uprising that happened a little over a year ago was that unlike, say, the 1960s or even previous periods where pe black people rose up in response to police violence, you had a black mayor, uh, you had a black police commissioner, you had a black, um, let's see, everything from the black state's attorney, the National Guard commander that was called in was black. And so this is, and even obviously there's even a black president today. So this is a vastly different situation than you know 40 or 50 years ago that black people are confronting. The, so what you think of as class contradictions are obvious because even at certain points, uh, the mayor even called the rioters thugs right, these thugs out here. And so where's that sort of racial solidarity that's supposed to <laughs> exist, right? Um, so what I'm, sort of, it's kind of you have that side of it, but also at the same time, one of the things that kind of kick-started a few years, like this was three years ago now, was the murder of Trayvon Martin. What was interestingly enough is he was actually murdered in a middle-class neighborhood. So though we see like these class contradictions at the same time, any black person, could be stopped, could be frisked, could even go to escalate to a higher level. So it's, it's sort of this, these, this issue of this contradiction there in of itself is this dynamic interplay that I call it between race and class. And so I'm, what I'm arguing and kind of building upon is an idea that uh, something, I'm arguing that black people in the United States are a domestic colony. And so this is something that even people like W.E.B. Du Bois in the 1930s argued, in the 1960s in the black power movement, League of Revolutionary Black Workers, many others argued that black people were a domestic colony, but something's changed. The colony isn't the same anymore. What I'm saying is that when you look at the Caribbean and African continent, for example, there was a transition from colonialism to a type of neo-colonialism, right, where you have an elite that's sort of an intermediary class. So after the 1965 Voting Rights Act that was passed, in 1964 you had around 350 black elected officials. Well, about 2011, there were over 10,000. 
And so that's a, that's a vast difference. From 350, 50 years ago to now, there's over 10,000 black elected officials. You have a black elite that's overseeing these cities that uh, many black people live in that, are be, that have been hollowed out through deindustrialization, lack of an economic base, people moving to the jobs being ship, shipped overseas or to other parts of the country. Um, and even you have to an extent, some studies show that there's actually more inequality within black America than there is between white America and black America, right? So there's deep inequalities that are some. So what I'm saying is something that's not being discussed enough that uh, it, to an extent within the movement for black lives is the idea of class struggle and the necessity of it. Because if you see, like in Washington, D.C., you have a, it's advanced stages of something, say, like gentrification, or the police violence is continuing, but you have a black mayor, you have a majority black city council, um, but at the same time, they're doing very little to nothing about the actual issues of that black, the majority, the black working class faces. And so I'm saying that you have to have an intense class struggle. And what I mean by that is where a section, or at least a class, the working class attempts to take uh, goes for political power, or at least a section of the class take political power. And what I'm saying, the form that it's going to take, and this was attempted somewhat in the 60s, was for community control of various areas of life, and to push forward past the sort of minimum civil rights demands that have been pushed, or like affirmative action and these types of things that have been pushed for the past 40 years. It's going to take much more than that. It's going to take a push for self-determination, but it has to be done by and for the black working class itself to come overcome this neo-colonial situation. And the class struggle has, I'm putting, and building on Jill Munti Kim, five sort of uh, purposes. One is to erode the legitimacy of a black bourgeoisie that's developed, uh, to discredit integration into the capitalist system, the idea that we can, you, you can integrate into it and be a part of it, um, removing the means to control the black colony, which is this black bourgeoisie, to remove them, their hegemony, and establish the hegemony of the black working class and to win them over to nationalism. So I'm arguing that this is a sort of national liberation struggle, but at the same time, there's an intense class struggle that animates it at the same time. And just to rate, this class struggle will raise the political consciousness to understand that the issues that are confronting the to face are, are much deeper than civil rights or even human rights. It, it's an issue of power, it's an issue of ending capitalism and imperialism and connecting those struggles of black people to imperialist and anti-colonial struggles that are taking place in other parts of the, the world. Um, so I'm saying, at the same time, you have this contradiction still yet that exists between colonizer and colonized. That I'm gonna put forward is still one of the primary contradictions. The United States itself, people have argued in the past, is a prison house of nations. That there are different nations that, that exist in the United States. There's an oppressor nation, and oppressed nations exist. Right? So, this, um, and, and this, this has played itself out, this sort of national struggles. Historically, you see even the, 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 the issue of racism within this country. It even impacts the white left. Right? Or we talk a lot about white workers and their racism. But historically, if you look at someone, say, like a Hubert Harrison, right? One of the great black socialists 100 years ago in the, in the uh, Socialist Party USA, who was w one of the leading figures, or probably one of the leading black figures, he, when trying to organize around black issues specifically, he was even told, we have nothing special to offer the Negro. And I'm not talking about the evolutionary socialists, as they're called. I'm talking about Eugene Debs and people who are supposed to be the more radical white socialists. Um, and he eventually had to leave because they weren't addressing the issues that were impacting black people specifically. Or later, Harry Haywood, who was one of the chief theoreticians of the black liberation movement in the CPUSA in the 1950s, was removed and purged out. Many people were. Why? Because as he said in, in his piece and even in his book, Black Bolshevik, was trying to push the issue of self-determination and the centrality uh, of racism. And he said one of the reasons he was removed was white chauvinism is a term he used. So I'm saying that black communities have to struggle for what was in the past for self-determination in the form of dual power, as was called previously, right? So the sort of building the ideas of like popular assemblies building a democratically controlled in areas of, so people can control everything from their health care.
healthcare, education, but democratically controlled. And how can this be done? I'm saying through a black workers party. So one of the criticisms of the movement for black lives has been that it's a sort of postmodern identity politics, some people have argued, one of the many criticisms. But I'm saying is to integrate this, but one of the chief things, as, as, as Julia mentioned, was that you do have women, black women, and black queer leadership that hasn't been there in the past. And that's one of the great strengths. But it's also uh, some issues where I'm saying that to integrate the ideas of class struggle and national liberation within the analysis and the strategy of the movement for black lives. And it can be done through a black workers' party that can establish the hegemony of the black working class within black communities and really using the idea of national liberation or nationalism as a springboard to na internationalism that many black people historically from Kwame Nkrumah to Kwame Ture to Du Bois or others have used these ideas as a springboard to internationalism as well. So that's sort of many of the ideas I had and I'm working with an organization, a uh, local group that was started last year around the murder of a, uh, uh, a 26 year old black man by a special police officer, which are private police. And we're pushing for uh, the idea of community control of police, where we actually have a community control board, and we actually literally control the, 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 the right to hire, fire, the budget of the police, not just a review board, something much deeper and much stronger. And so I can get into more details about that. Uh, but this is sort of what we're doing, and I think the direction I think we need to go, and how do we connect as well the, the issues. So it's, it's not just trying to be in our own silos as black people here, but as well as connecting our struggle to people internationally and their struggles against neoliberalism as our black bourgeoisie attempts to sort of impose its, uh, these sort of neoliberal ideas on black people in the United States and establish the hegemony of the black working class. So that's generally the presentation. I just want to thank us. That's all. Thanks, Ben. And just to another, uh, housekeeping kind of note. So what I would like to do is uh, have Dan come up. I was going to say a few words and then allow the speakers to respond and op if you'd like to whatever the speakers are saying and then open it up to question and comment. And I'm also going to just request, because we have a full house, yay, um, that people keep their comments to like one or two minutes just so everybody has a chance to speak. So again, I wanted to introduce uh, Dan Jojakas. He is an incredible writer, academic, and also activist. One of his famous, incredible, life-changing books is Detroit, I Do Mind Dying, about the Dodd Revolutionary Union Movement, the Ford Revolutionary Union Movement, and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. Uh, it'll be great to hear you know, your perspective on DRUM and how its implications can be seen today. Please welcome Dan Jojakas. No, 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 I'm fine. Uh, thanks for all that lavish praise. <clears throat> Don't think I deserve it, but anyhow, here we go. Uh, one of the questions I think people would have to ask is, uh, how does this Greek American uh, have all these things to say about the league? What, where, where does the sources come from? Well, I was born and raised in Detroit, <clears throat> and I came of age, of political age, in the late 50s and early 60s. And at that time, there was a dynamic, radical uh, educational movement going on. Um, there were three or four discussion groups. Raya Duvinevskaya had news and letters, um, which was, uh, I thought, very authoritarian and so forth, but she had some interesting ideas. She talked about Marxist un humanism. <coughs> there was Jimmy Boggs, um, who was, had a tremendous influence on young people, his house would be open, you go there, sit around, talk with them for half an hour, an hour or so, as long as you wanted to. Um, and he had very interesting things to say, and he would soon publish a book in the Monthly Review. There was a CLR James group, uh, who was a Trinidadian uh, thinker, and um, they had irregular meetings too. And there was a Socialist Workers' Party, which had a Friday night socialist forum, which they did not have only their own speakers. Uh, I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but most of us would usually go on the nights when they didn't have their speakers, <laughs> when, when they had the guest speakers who were activists of some kind. I, don't, I say that, but it, you know, it's not true, because they had some good, good people too. But in other words, it wasn't a party 
uh, thing where, oh, aren't we, bra aren't, you, aren't we great? Please join us, but let's discuss these things. So it's a fair play for Cuba Committee, uh, Freedom Now Party, whatever it is, they would b let those people come in and talk. As a matter of fact, they gave my first political speech at the Socialist Workers Conference in 65 <laughs> on the rioting in Greece, uh, suggesting it might be a coup d'etat in the near future. At any rate, in that immediately, oh, there are other things going on too, um, <clears throat> which does pertain to the league. Um, there, Detroit is a very racist city. Um, you, most people don't know that in, the, in 1900, we had a group called the Black Legion, which was to the right of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, yeah, it had 20,000 members in the city of Detroit or in the area of Detroit. And it uh, marched in mayor's parades, and it murdered people, and it beat up people, and so forth. And it was really not put out of business until um, the New Deal, when they killed the New Dealer, and the federal government came in and put them out of business. Uh, so that's, a, and then there was Dudley Randall, Dudley Randall, uh, librarian, uh, black librarian, number of poets in Detroit said, you know, all these best poets of 1958, best poets, around, they're all white. They're, they're almost all male, and they're all white. What about the black voices? And so Dudley uh, began something called Broadside Press. And Broadside Press would become the top uh, publisher of black poetry in the United States. Uh, Barry Gordy uh, had an idea in his garage, and Motown Records <laughs> arose. So it was a period in which people were thinking, wow, well, what, what can we do next? And we can be successful. Um, also point, point out something called the Unstable Theater, which is the first uh, integrated theater in Detroit, in which one director was black and one director was white. And the roles were cast, you know, if you're good enough to play that role, you suit this role, you, you get it, no matter what your race is. And so there was about half the actors were black and half were white. But there wasn't, it wasn't tokenism. It was just like, oh, he's not good for that part. Oh, she's right for that part. So I was part of all that stuff. And uh, in that milieu is when I met many people who would be, in fact, I met, I think, all the people who would become the League of Revolutionary uh, Black Workers uh, leading committee. John Watson, uh, Mike Hamlin, Ken Cockrell, Luke Tripp, John Williams. Um, a friend of mine who is a, a lawyer, was a lawyer for General Baker when he was charged with insurrection in 1962. And uh, he wasn't a very good lawyer because when he got finished talking, the judge said, uh, are you trying to get this guy convicted? Because <laughs> 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 he was, anyhow. So that's, that's, the, that's the milieu I came out of, which is different than researching a project, going to a place and say, oh, let me find out about this place. Um, so with that, let me actually say something substantive. <laughs> May 1968, the Dodge Assembly Plant, main Dodge Assembly Plant in Hamtramck, which is a suburb within the city of Detroit, was closed by 4,000 workers in a wildcat strike. So it was shut down, and it would remain shut down for a number of days. The strike was not spontaneous, as most wildcat strikes were in Detroit, but was led by a group which took the name Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement. It had all the usual things you'd expect in a black liberation movement in the 1960s. It also had a whole string of worker demands, and the language was in Marxist language. Chrysler Corporation was stunned. The UAW said, where the hell do they come from? Uh, the Wall Street Journal had a first front page story with a photo saying the commies are back. <laughs> So, the workers in Detroit 
black workers in Detroit, responded by forming rums, Ford rum, Cadillac rum, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, UPS rum. And a year or so later, they would merge in something called the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. Uh, and they would be pretty active. They would be active as an organization for four or five years. And after the organization fell apart, almost everybody in it remained active in the movement uh, in various things that they did. So I'm going to talk about that movement. I'm not interested in nostalgia, in the good old days when my hair was black and wavy. Uh, <laughs> I don't believe the League is a, uh, uh, a model to be followed like a catechism. Um, but I think we want to look at the orientation of the League and particularly the imagination they brought to various problems and to see how we can take that kind of imagination, really bring, you know, they say, oh, I'm pushing the envelope. You people say they're pushing the envelope, usually sealing it and sending it to the, uh, to the bank. Uh, <laughs> they really want to tear open the envelope. And what, how can they help us do that? Okay, what made the League different from the other organizations of the time is that the focus was on workers. Traditional Marxist approach, but they were very clear. Popular power is strongest at the point of production. Where value is created is where you have a lot of power, and that's where most people are. So if you can organize that power, you have a good chance to change society. If not all of society, some part of society. Uh, <clears throat> John Watson uh, was a uh, the League, in general, was criticized for uh, <coughs> thinking that a small number of blacks, I think you brought this up, could, could possibly change American society. And he said, quite simply, if every black worker in Detroit goes on general strike one day, the city shuts down. And if black workers around the country go on a general strike, the city, the country shuts down. Uh, I think we could say the same thing about Latinos. And we can also remember the Longshoremen's Union about two years ago stopped a lot of trade uh, with the strike. A traditional union, traditional strike, and they too shut down uh, trans-Pacific uh, shipping for a while. So that was the idea of the League, to organize enough black workers uh, to be able to someday pull a general strike, but certainly uh, immediately to do things in the city of Detroit. Uh, okay. Another bonus from organizing workers uh, is that you immediately enter family situations. Workers have families. Workers have bills to pay. They, have, they worry about housing, they worry about education, they worry about transportation, they worry about police brutality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So by organizing around workers, you're actually entering immediately into society. Uh, whereas, and I love students, and I'm glad they're all voting for Bernie, uh, but students aren't like that. Students don't have that power yet. Uh, that's just where they are later on in one of the newspapers uh, the League would have a subtitle, One Class Conscious Worker Equals 100 Students. Well, that wasn't to denigrate students. That was to honor workers and how much power they really had as they didn't know they had. And they thought one of the things they had to do was make people clear how much power they really had. Now, the structure of the League, and I think that's something that we all have to think about. The structure of the League is very, very important, uh, interesting and unique. It had a six-person executive. Six. Why? They didn't want any one personality to dominate. It wasn't going to be Jones's organization or Smith's organization. They were going to have a six-person. And in fact, one of the problems that came out later was when they began to get a little, not, I wouldn't say jealous of one another, but suspicious that one or the other was trying to personalize the organization. They also felt that if you had a six-person uh, executive, 
it was harder to behead the organization. It didn't matter if somebody got sick. Uh, it didn't matter if one of them uh, had a marital affair and couldn't function very well. So there was protection in having six rather than one. Um, and most importantly, it allowed diversity of action and it gave more power to the base than it did to the executive. Um, some of the esoteric can I look at Zapata and how he organizes armies in Mexico, very similar to this. He had 50 captains. Uh, he was the leader, but the 50 captains made the decisions. But I'll, that's, an, that's an aside. The league leaders call themselves Marxist-Leninists. Since I'm here at Left Forum, most of you know what a Marxist-Leninist is. They were not Marxist-Leninists. <laughs> they were not a vanguard party. Um, they did not structure themselves a vanguard party. Uh, they were closer to an anarcho-syndicalist organization. Uh, <clears throat> when the organization began to uh, falter and have problems, some one group in the group thought that, yes, we made a mistake. We should be a vanguard party and went in that direction, and others uh, went in a different direction. Um, I say that because <clears throat> if, you look, if you look at the movie, finally got the news, and you'll see John Watson talking. It's his, it's his living room, and the, there's a big uh, collage behind him. It was, that collage is not made for the movie. That collage is in the house for about 10 or 15 years. And you had Malcolm X on it. <laughs> you had uh, Mao. <laughs> you had Ho Chi Minh. You had uh, uh, Nkrumah, I think. Angolan freedom fighters, et cetera, because when they said Marxist Leninists, what they really were saying is, we're revolutionaries. And if any of these guys have any idea that we can use, we're going to use it, but we're not going to model ourselves necessarily because we don't live in Angola. We're not, Cuba, you're not Cubans, et cetera, et cetera. Interestingly enough, when it came time to expand, they have a very different view than other, party, other parties, particularly, let's say, the Black Panthers. They did not, they had workers writing to them from Richmond, Virginia, uh, excuse me, Richmond, uh, California, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, steel workers, uh, Cleveland, Baltimore, Malwa, New Jersey, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, we'd like to form a branch of the League of Revolution Black Workers here. And the League said, no. Uh, the reason we don't want to do that is, one, we don't have any money to help you. We certainly don't have any people to send to you because we gotta, we're here trying to overthrow J General Motors, Chrysler, and Ford. Do you think we can send people all over the country uh, to do these other things? Uh, they also, and this is something that we have to all take into consideration, they didn't know who these people really were. And Let's say you have 10 of these organizations join the league, and just one of them is infiltrated by the police or is a, set up by the cops or has crazies, and they begin acting in the name of the league, and then the people in Detroit have to stop and take care of, oh, no, that's not really who we are, et cetera, et cetera. So for reasons of security uh, was another reason. But deep down, the really profound reason was they didn't believe in it. They thought every location should create its own local leaders because only the local leaders would understand the social dynamics, the industrial dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. Birmingham was steel. Steel's not auto. Birmingham's in the south. Detroit's in the north. So they wanted these groups to form their own local leadership their own local programs, uh, and then they could talk about coming together. How are they going to come together? They're going to come together as something to be called the Black Workers' Congress. But the Black Workers' Congress would not be a vanguard party. It would be a federation in which all these independent, viable groups would have joint uh, uh, voting powers and so forth. And in fact, the Black Workers Con Congress did come into existence. It didn't last very long <clears throat> because of the time and so forth. And 
Um, to another aspect of the league, which people don't think about too much, by then already, they had Koreans units and they had Latino units in the Black Workers Congress because they were already beginning to say this is going to be a workers organization. Uh, <clears throat> I was pretty good friends with um, Wilbur Haddock, who was uh, had the group called the Black Brotherhood at uh, Malwa, New Jersey, which is the Ford plant. And they applied for membership in the league, and the league said no. And they are they are kind of pissed. Like, Who the hell are these people in Detroit telling us we're not good enough? To but they thought about it a little bit, and he said, and we soon discovered that when there was a problem, rather than going to Detroit to get help, we talked to our members and we said, what are we doing wrong? And that was much more productive. Uh, and so he, in the end, he really endorsed uh, that movement. Now, one of the things that distinguished the league, I think, another, another <laughs> distinguishing thing is media. The league understood that mass media is anti, well, is pro-status quo and will distort, mm -hmm. disinform, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea was not to speak truth to power. Power already knows the truth. <laughs> you had to speak truth to those who didn't have power and didn't know they had power. And so their media was directed toward that. Um, in this one of these study groups I went into, <clears throat> they had read Lenin, they'd read uh, some Marx, and the, the pamphlet of Lenin that they liked the best, or was most influential, um, was the one on newspapers, in which Lenin said he can use newspapers to create a mass base upon which an organization can arise. It must not, it must not be, it must use the correct language. Uh, it has to use popular language, has to use idiomatic language, but it doesn't have to be written down. It just has to use that kind of language. They thought that was a good idea, and they started something called the Inner City Voice. The Inner City Voice was so successful that the Detroit Police Department went to every printer who considered printing this newspaper and said, if you print one more issue of this paper, the health department's going to be here, the fire department's going to be here, the tax collector's going to be here, and so forth. So no printer in the city of Detroit dared publish this newspaper, and they had it sent it to Chicago, where it was published by Mohammed Speaks, the Black Muslim Organization, which was then in a revolutionary editorship, and then shipped back to Detroit. How successful was it? Mike Hamlin and General Baker say that it's the inner city voice was a newspaper they used at Dodge, Maine to begin to discuss things. And the group that arose out of Dodge, Maine didn't focus on the inner city voice, but it, it served that purpose. It changed that consciousness. A year later, uh, <clears throat> John Watson uh, was able to get himself elected president or uh, editor of the South End, which is Wayne State University's uh, college newspaper. 10,000 daily circulation, um, paid staff. So he gets in and he said, you know, this is a public resource. This is funded by the public. Therefore, we have to serve the entire public. And so half the newspapers would leave the campus and end up in laundromats, uh, hospital rooms, uh, you know, waiting rooms for hospitals, factory gates, and so forth. And it was, much of the content was very similar to the inner city voice. Um, and people in the league were paid to write for the newspaper. So he said, we've socialized one of the organs of the state for our purposes. Um, they were so bold with this. Uh, uh, sorry, Ben. Mm. Uh, too long? Just a little bit because we have okay. to wrap up. Okay. I want to get a chance. I, to yeah, okay. So I got so much to do, but I'll, I'll zip. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll leave out the Palestinian issue. Oh. <laughs> 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 <That's, I'm laughs> gonna, well, let me just say briefly, they support the Palestinian liberation movement mm -hmm. without being anti-Semitic. 
making it very clear, here Israel, here are Jews, here's foreign policy, here's social policy, etc., etc. So the city, the state, the federal government, the uh, funders of the Wayne State Unit, they put all their power to, to break the paper and get him kicked off the staff. It didn't work. In other words, they, they survived uh, because of the way they conceived this thing. Um, okay, briefly, newspapers aren't going to work today. Uh, we're talking about electronic media. Uh, and I think that that's, but the orientation, the boldness that they showed is, is what we can take. And one thing that I think is lacking is a central um, electronic media where everybody kind of goes to, not just your favorite blog, so that you have some place of consensus instead of a flea market, uh, ideological free market. Um, the League was very good at, at forming concepts. Uh, when a black worker uh, went into a factory, killed two white workers, and a black worker, the paper said, well, this is a crazy man. Uh, what do you expect? The League said, Chrysler pulled the trigger. That conditions in Chrysler and how they treated this man had led to this murder, uh, and therefore, that was the defense. Cut it long story short, they won. And the worker won, won workman's compensation for the damage done to him, but he did have to spare, serve some time and, and so forth. Uh, another time, Cockrell, uh, who's the attorney, uh, had brought, he had all these civil rights cases, he brought in somebody to the police uh, under special circumstances because the, the person was afraid the police were going to kill him when he surrendered. So they had the certain thing set up. Uh, Deal went through, and then as soon as the guy was in um, cu custody, the uh, judge rescinded all the agreements. And Cockle comes out and says, "You are a racist monkey, a hunky dog fool, and a thriving and a thieving pirate." And the Detroit Bar Association said, "Well, okay, now we got him. We can kick him out from being an attorney." And he said, "No." What we're going to do is I'm going to prove that. And in fact, he won that case. And it was a judge who, uh, who had to make an apology. Well, I was going to tell you some other things, uh, which I'll let him go. One more thing and then open up the discussion. Uh, the film finally got the news. A group from uh, New York called Newsreel came to Detroit and wanted to make a film about the League. And the League said, that's a good idea, but uh, here's the problem. Uh, we don't want to be a film about us. We want to be a film by us. So read my book. You see how they did it. They became the producers of the film. They became the producers of the film. They did not, uh, they did not put a lot of uh, pressure at all on the filmmakers because once they trusted them, they trusted them. Uh, and the filmmakers came through. A film got made got distributed in the United States, got distributed in Sweden, got distributed in Italy, got distributed in, uh, in England. Um, the Italian connection is interesting because the League had connections with uh, Poterio, Paraya, Workers Control. Uh, La Luta continued, the struggle continues, and the party of proletarian socialist unity. And you know, when you had about your third or fourth drink, they said, won't it be great someday when the auto workers have a general strike with one site in Torino and one site in Detroit and have the same set of demands. Uh, I was going to talk about police brutality and so forth. We'll talk about that. I'm really happy about Bernie Sanders having put a spike into the dam and nine million people responded. Now what are we going to do about those nine million? And I'm just going to conclude with a statement about, by Ken Cockrell about the problems we face. We see that this whole society exists and rests on workers, and this whole motherfucking society is controlled by a little clique that is parasitic, vulturistic, cannibalistic, and is sucking and destroying the life of workers everywhere, and we must stop it because it is evil.
thank you. Thank you so much for um, your contributions, both of your contributions to our discussion. Uh, similarly to you know what Dan had raised, Left Voice is also interested in different perspectives and opinions. It's important for us um, as political people, as revolutionaries, to engage each other in a comradely and honest way about our different perspectives. Uh, for us, you know, we are a Trotskyist organization, we're a socialist organization, and we're also, you know, internationalists. And we've all been talking about internationalism and really building an international revolutionary organization where we are in constant contact discussions about what people are doing. Sure, local things, people have different things that they're doing, but internationally, we need to have a united revolutionary organization against capitalism. That has to happen. Capitalism is international. We need to be international. Uh, and furthermore, um, I wanted to kind of mention a, an example of when I was able to go to Argentina and a youth named Mariano Ferreira was murdered by the Peronist Union bureaucracy. He was murdered in broad daylight. They shot him dead. And in two hours, the Buenos Aires subways shut down. The workers just stopped working. Uh, where I was in Neoquén, where they had the worker control factories, they shut down within an hour. Um, the, whole the whole country was shut down with strikes, work stoppages, protests, and things like that. And that's the kind of thing that I believe we need to do and we can do in this country. When they murder us, we stop working, period. It should not just be us going, going home or boycotting. Like, we have to stop working. And if we think of ourselves as workers, I'm a union member, I'm a member of SEIU 721. Some of us are workers, some of us are union members. We should, even if we work at Burger King, we work at Foot Locker, we work any of these other places, we should be talk talking to our coworkers so that we can build for something where when they, they kill us or they touch us or any of that, we have the capacity to shut, shut it down economically. And, and it's something that we're, we're uh, able to do. Um, I, I also wanted to, to say briefly, we had a speaker that was supposed to come, her name was Alexis Tolliver, um, and it was incorrectly stated, we did email them, but it was, you know, an honest mistake that she, she is um, a former lead organizer of BLM Cambridge, not, not Boston, but I just wanted to make sure I, I said that she's a great organizer and person, and she's also a black autistic activist, and we fight for the, the rights of, of dis the, the disabled as well, of all forms of disability, because the police target people who are disabled as well as people who are gay and people who are women and people who are black and immigrant and things like that. Um, I, wanted, I wanna be able to open it up for questions, but I, I wanted to also just point out that, you know, in, in our article, we talk about different things, different tactics in terms of fighting police brutality. And it's important that we see ourselves with the, the organizing tactics that we do is to destroy the system of police. The police are, are not our friends. They're not part of the working class. They oppress the working class. Um, just just want to make that point again. Because uh, some folks is thinking, you know, no, like they're not, they're not part of us. When we're on the picket line, they kick our ass. They don't march with us. So um, it's important that we, and we have some free stickers if y'all want no cops in our unions because the UAW did pass a resolution, the Black Caucus of the UAW passed a resolution to kick the cops out of the AFL-CIO and I think people who are part of the AFL-CIO should do that as well. Um, and, and the last part I wanted to, to mention was the role of, um, of internationalism. Uh, our perspective as Left Voice is that and what we're doing is to build an international organization that represents all the history of repression and resistance of all oppressed people. And we believe that we need to work together to really understand each other's struggles and being in the same political revolutionary organization. Um, you know, a lot of times I know there's been discussion about allies or whatever, but I think there's some problematic perspective in terms of that. Because how can one be an ally to black working class people and then be an ally to Obama, who bombs black people and African people? It is not possible. There is a contradiction and that is a class contradiction, as other folks have pointed out. Um, it's not possible to do that. So I believe that we have to be allies in terms of our class and in terms of our, our experiences as oppressed people. 
In any case, um, I wanted to invite you all and welcome you all if you aren't already to join and participate in the revolutionary movement against capitalism. There are other organizations here, we're Left Voice, we're very proud of the work that we do in our perspective in terms of internationalism and socialism. Uh, but you know, I encourage all of us to start, to start now, to continue to fight against this capitalist system and to continue to fight and organize, not just in our communities as we've seen, but also organizing in our workplaces so that we have, we have the capacity to shut it down economically, that we build that power because actually in reality, we're the majority and they're the minority. And I'd like to just end and what I'm saying and then open it up for discussion with the comrades that we have in, uh, in Mexico who are just, were able to, um, are participating in an anti-capitalist assembly um, or a con constitutional assembly, excuse me, that hasn't happened in 100 years and they were able to force the very brutal and repressive Mexican government to acknowledge them. One of the comrades said, history is ours. Um, they've done everything they could to repress us, to intimidate us, to pacify us, to jail us. But we have history on our side, and we are making history. And history is ours for the taking. All we have to do is be committed, organize, and fight against a common enemy, and that is white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy. So thank you so much for listening to us. Uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Comments, you don't have to ask a question. We're not gonna make you form your comment into the form of a question, so you know. No, just keep it to one or two minutes, please, so that people have a chance to, so people have a chance to participate. So, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I was really excited to hear the speaker this time and um, what we're coming together to understand to try and fight this, this uh, juggernaut that keeps us in a bubble and not understanding what's happening in the world. And um, what the brother here said, uh, the brother here and my sister here said, uh, really spoke to the issue of uh, a need for international trade unions and international uh, workers unions. And I was wondering uh, in uh, your uh, travels, in your understanding, in your involvement with unions, have you been able to connect uh, with unions in Botswana, with unions in, uh, say, uh, um, uh, Burkina Faso. It, it, because when we look at what uh, Kwame Nkrumah said, uh, when in fighting a, a revolution is vital to have the ability to shut people down through the miners' unions, through the gold unions. And if we were able to connect with those ideas that are happening there and utilize our political, the limited political power that we have here to, uh, uh, to help to control the oppression and the repression of the unions in those places, then we, we have something. Because as you say, we have uh, you know, a situation where there's a class struggle and we have a situation where we have neoliberalism where our jobs are being taken overseas. And as our jobs are taken overseas, it decreases the ability for us to make money here. It decreases uh, uh, for us to be able to make a living for ourselves in the United States as a, as a, a, a people of, of, of oppression. So we have this repressive system of police. <coughs> what, where have you uh, been involved with talking to trade unions and labor unions internationally? I'm a member of CWA, Communication Workers in Washington, uh, Baltimore Guild. Mm -hmm. Washington International. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what I have uh, seen, I think to me, is one of the most exciting labor movements in the world mm -hmm. is in South Africa. Uh -huh. uh, with the National Union Metal Workers in South Africa. Yeah. And they're breaking, and actually getting kicked out of the SATU, yeah. with the uh, uh, South African Trade Union. Yeah. And I was able to, uh, Urban Jim, Secretary General of the Union. He's been doing trips to the United States and then uh, another person, Bobby, who was head of, who was removed from the sort of tripartite, the mm -hmm. and the sort of tripartite alliance that was there. Uh, they've been coming to the United States and I had a chance to meet and talk with him. They've come a few times, I know, to the U.S. trying to build international solidarity because they've been talking about building a, a workers' party or at a minimum soon 
uh, international labor, not international, but a, a new labor federation mm -hmm. in South Africa. Uh, and they are led, I mean, that moves have led, they're explicitly Marxist in their way, their mm -hmm. leadership. And they want to, they're trying to start at least minimum a, a independent labor federation that pushes for true revolution of the taking back the land and the resources. Mm -hmm. And is internationalist and connects with other people. Mm -hmm. They understand that, you know, I guess they kind of see, though they may be critical of countries that have disagreements with Zimbabwe, one of the things that's obvious has happened is once they started taking back the land, international capital just, you know, yeah. attacked. Yeah. And so the need to build that sort of internationalism, they see that. And mm -hmm. I think that's uh, one of the struggles that I think has with, with leadership and the possibility in South Africa mm -hmm. and other things happening in South Africa and other places that I think in terms of union movements that mm -hmm. I see mm -hmm. that I particularly follow one of them that I think is really powerful is someone who's an internationalist or pan-Africanist mm -hmm. really I think uh, everyone should really follow and try to support in solidarity because they're traveling trying to build that solidarity South Africa. South Africa. Uh -huh. Yes, in South Africa. So yeah. form new labor federation. Yeah. Right. When the uh, the Marikana miners were murdered by the South African government, um, many of them actually were Zimbabwean immigrants. Mm -hmm. So you had a situation where you had African people uh, murdered by other African people yeah. by an African-led government, a post-apartheid African-led yeah. government. Right. And that's kind and right, like that's kind mm -hmm. of opened up, made more clear the contradictions. And I think it's so important when we think about unions and organizing ourselves also because it's the only way outsourcing works is that uh, imperialism is allowed to pay people in other countries mm -hmm. pennies to the dollar. Yeah. And so it isn't that, and you know, I'm not, I don't want to imply that you're su suggesting it, but it, ha it does sometimes happen where the discussion is these people are taking our jobs. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not saying you, but yeah, I just want to yeah. put it out, put yeah. it out there about yeah. this perspective, right? It's like, it's not that these people are taking our jobs. No. It's that in these other countries, people are being completely exploited mm -hmm. in a colonial way, mm -hmm. and we are not organized together mm -hmm. to be able to demand mm -hmm. an international wage that everyone can live and it off drives of. Down because they. Because it's because they use the same thing with black people in the United exactly. States. They would use black people mm -hmm. as scab mm -hmm. to undermine other majority white working place factories. Mm -hmm. So then the they would pay the black workers less. Mm -hmm. So what we what what some white workers and organizations got smart and realized was mm -hmm. that instead of being antagonistic and racist, mm -hmm. that they needed to build a united, organized, in, uh, integrated union. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to be international just as exactly. international, international capital. Union. Right, so these folks are, so when we talk about those things, it's international, an international union. Mm -hmm. um, and for us in Left Voice, we are, you know, uh, some of us are heading some of the unions internationally in, in Brazil, in Argentina. Uh -huh. um, we just actually had a panel right before this one about the worker control factories in Argentina that some of our comrades are, are heading. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, our perspective is not just to have our person to be a head of a union, but to actually build rank and file unionism against this bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. You know, what Ferguson did was they kicked out the local community bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is kick out the trade union bureaucracy that's in alliance with the Democratic Party that's been com keeping us from being able to fight back and mm -hmm. build an independent political perspective. And yeah. I, and you know, to be honest with the Sanders phenomena, I like the Sanders followers more than I particularly like Sanders himself, <laughs> um, especially with the question of Palestine and, other, and some other international issues. Right. Um, but I think that those people, those folks that are getting introduced to socialism, mm -hmm. you know, instead of saying, well, you're doing it wrong or whatever, is that actually we can take it further. We don't just need to have socialism for, you know, as a word and still be in the Democratic Party. We actually can have a worldwide socialist society where oppressed people, working class people can yeah. run it ourselves. Yeah. And we can, and it, that's, that's actually possible. It's not like a pie in the sky thing. We yeah. can do that. So yeah. any, in any case, um, it did other folks. 
Oh, that wasn't a uh, NUMSA. National, yeah, NUMSA. It's not necessarily NUMSA. mine. It's National Union Metal Workers of South Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Go ahead, please, and then yourself, and then you, and yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've done some quite a few seminars for the IBEW, IBW. which is one of the most conservative unions <laughs> there is, uh, and it's a it was a cause a, um, it was a kind of a seminars, and uh, they wanted to have those workers become more class conscious. Of course, they didn't want them to become revolutionaries. Okay. But uh, they were very anxious about issues like uh, they had a lot of Latinos had en- had entered the union, blacks were entering the union, and in this particular union, in this particular local, which is Local Three, they were trying to educate their members that this is a good thing. Uh, so it's it's a <laughs> it's a paltry answer to your thing, but there are su- some unions, and I'm sure if you went around the country, you'd find a local here and a local there doing that kind of stuff. So it's not hopeless. I I think a lot, I think you're, you know, a lot of times when people talk about their unions, most of the time it's a contest about whose union does the least. <laughs> 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 well, my union doesn't meet at all. Well, my union, they all, da, da, da. Yeah, and because, you know, the, the formation of a union is not the same thing as the political tactics, right? And, you know, um, uh, you can have a union that supports the Democratic Party, you can have a union that fights against <laughs> it, and those things are possible. So it's not that the union itself is an issue, but it's that there's been decades of defeats, decades of defeats. And, um, and if you look at some of the struggles that have happened worldwide, people say biggest thing in 30 years, biggest protest in 30, this is not just in the United States. When Mubarak was overthrown, that was the first time in 30 years so there's been a lull that's happened. 
Um, and we're coming out of that, thank goodness. But I think we have to kind of educate folks about the class struggle. That was part of the reason why we put this together, is that like if you think of what groups that people look back to, like the Panthers. The Panthers did a lot of community organizing, but they didn't do a whole lot of workplace organizing. They didn't concept, they conceptualized the community, not the workplace. And a lot of folks still conceptualize, what do we do when we're pissed off and we want to fight back? We'll shut down a street, we'll t do a bridge, we'll do a protest, we'll do this. People don't think of, I'll talk to my coworkers, and we're going to take over this, the, our jobs, and we're not going to allow any other work to happen until our demands are met. A lot of young people don't even have that conception in their mind to do it, even as brave and courageous as they are. So it's up to us, especially people who are, have been through those struggles and people who are interested in reading those struggles, we have to relearn and reteach ourselves and younger folks about those struggles. We have to start doing it. What do they say, Radiance? We have to start somewhere. We have to start sometime. What better place than here? What better time than now? Uh, <laughs> So we have to. So we have to. We have to relearn some of these things. Um, you wanted to say something, yeah. and then I see you. I see you, and you, and you, and you, and you. Okay, it's going to be hard for me to remember more than that. So just give me a second. <laughs> Go yeah, ahead. Uh, the issue of political education is really important in unions. That's something I just don't. I don't see happening much. I know people who are labor organizers, and a lot of labor unions, like particularly like SEIU, is really trying to hit young people of color, labor organizers more and more. But they're not, when I talk to them, and I just, some people are my friends and comrades, they, they're not being taught like labor history. They're not being taught about the CIO in the 30s or anything that happened previously. Like he just put Ben Fletcher's name. Yes, me did I know him. <laughs> Most people don't know Ben Fletcher and IWW was one of the great you know, revolutionaries in Philadelphia, led a labor union. But like the sort of history of how- black man leading white workers. Yeah. <laughs> And like they, they didn't, uh, that's very important, and like they didn't, uh, that, that sort of history and just the contempt, like the issues of class struggle, it, even the labor organizers, the youngest ones just don't have that. And I think that's what I've seen is like one of the biggest uh, uh, like deficiencies is just a basic political education of kind of policies, history of the labor movement, and understanding why is it that the labor movement in the U.S. is so strong, and why is it like you study you mentioned Nkrumah and these other places in Caribbean or Africa and other countries. Why is it that there the labor movement was so central to their movement mm -hmm. and so it was powerful and even labor movements still are able to shut things down in other countries? Why do they, they even think about that and here it's not necessarily thought about as much? Mm -hmm. It's an issue of political education and that's something that for the membership and actually the organizing will have to have. And I think one of the issues that, that brings it is like if you look at the 30s when you had industrial unionism, very strong, you had organizations outside of whether they were, were the CPUSA or certain Trotskyist groups or others, you had independent organizations that were actually the ones pushing those unions and doing a lot of political education for them. And so I think that's what's missing. You have to have something even like either a new labor federation or some sort of party that's going to do those things, that's going to actually really do a lot of the education. And the, right, the other thing is people to BLM's credit, they refused the endorsement of the Democratic Party and they did not endorse any of the Democrats or Republicans. But in their statement, they said they're against all political parties. And I think that that is not, that's another equivocation, if I'll say so. Like with being anti-union or being anti-party. Because a political party is just a manifestation of people, people's political ideas in an organized way. The Black Panther Party was not a co-opting organization movement. Um, so we have, or, or the Mississippi Freedom Party, Freedom. There's a lot of different political parties that have existed um, that have played the roles, like Ben was saying. So I think we also have to take back some of these perspectives that are put into our heads about what a political party is, and actually form a class-independent political party. Not just a third party, but that's you know not part of the two of them, but actually one that has no capitalists, no cops, no bigots. It's just not allowed. It's just not acceptable. And see what we come up with. Yeah. I think that you know <laughs> when you don't have capitalists in your party, it's a little different. You know, it's even if it's not the Democrats. So in any case, um, I just wanted to make that point about that is political education. I will see you, you, and then you. I'm uh, from the D, you know, from Washington, D.C. So oh, wow. 
So I just wanted to speak on that. And the reason why I speak on that is that um, I was part of uh, creating the 1199 Union back in Ohio oh. uh, mm -hmm. back in the 80s. And uh, I received a lot of flack. And uh, my job was actually jeopardized at the time for that. And But I, one thing I want to speak on, and uh, this is among all three of you, how do you go to your union members and educate to them, educate them that the power they have within the system to not only keep jobs, but to have some foresight in how powerful the union can be. That, that's my first question. I, I, what do you do? Because the, the thing about it that I came up with was job safety. Um, they felt like when they were in the union and they speak out on some of the things that are going on, like contracts that were contradicting the workers' mobility, and just being in the hospital, because I'm a nurse, they were really apprehensive in doing that, and thought I was pretty much crazy in creating it. And so I was getting a lot of flack, not only within my profession, but also within the hospital. So that's one thing I want to ask, and, and, and I think you were one to mobilize those in the union members to figure out you know, what to do in terms of strikes and how powerful that could be. I'm not saying that, I don't know if that's <laughs> that's the hope no we have not struck struck for police brutality i really would love that no, like I, the idea is to the fact of, of, it's of just you know uh some of the on track uh, type of uh abuse that was going on in the community I widespread uh, <laughs> uh and, and that's what i want that's my first question the second one is is that trump has brought out uh, a constituency of white workers who are now being introduced to unemployment. Uh, like, you know, they were asleep at the time uh, in terms of being brought up to racism and things like that, and the contradictions of, of that. You know, the Labor Party seemed to always connect, no matter, not based by race, but due to labor. And, and I'm wondering how that's going to affect Trump's position in terms of discrimination and white supremacy in connecting that labor party with white and black. And the second thing I want to do, since this brother is from uh, Baltimore, from the DM DMV, uh, the legal process of Freddie uh, Gray's case and the alliance to the legal system. Uh, my brother's doing a film on that, and his segment is, you know, we just had a police officer uh, in court a couple of weeks ago testifying, and I wonder what the alliance is going to be in terms of the prosecution uh, and getting investigating in terms of the, of the procedures, procedures that occurred in the killing of Freddie Gray and uh, African Americans of youth all through the country. What, how, how is the legal system, which has been presented, I'm from Chicago area too, corruption? You know, where is that going to play a part? So I have three questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so what's the, now remember, I'm in Washington, D.C., not Baltimore. I'm in Washington, D.C. So, so what were you, what's the, uh, repeat, what was the question you asked about the? Well, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, there always seems to be an alliance between the legal proceedings and the police. Like and prosecutors and the police? Or prosecutors. Oh, okay, yeah. And I'm wondering just how that's going to play out uh, in the case of Freddie Gray, and like it has played out in so many other cities. Oh. I know the only thing I could, I, like I said, I don't, I'm not organizing in Baltimore. I know people who are uh -huh. and comrades who are organizing around a case and things, but uh -huh. I know in Chicago what people are doing is are putting for independent, uh, like, uh, investigators and independent, like, uh, prosecutors mm -hmm. for, I don't know, you know, that's what some people are doing. I don't know if that's the answer, but I'm just saying that's what other people are doing, something independent of that, because especially in Chicago, that's where I know some people are starting to ask for things like that. But I'm not there to give more. I think the difficulty is that the legal system is connected with the police system, which is against us. Yeah. And so a lot of times in the police brutality mm -hmm. movement, you know, someone will get murdered and people will rise up. And then it'll go to court because people rose up so much that the police are now forced to kind of answer for it in the court. But once it goes to the court, it just dies, disappears, that's it. Maybe you get a few people that come to the court and they get thrown out or they get arrested. But once, I believe, and that's another reason why striking against 
police murder is such an important concept that we need to start to organize around. What's not, I don't think it's happening here in this country, but it's something that I think as revolutionaries, we need to be thinking about that, conceptualizing that, is because the courts are against us. They are part of the capitalist system. They aren't independent. We see that. Whenever there's a mass mobilization, generally the court rules in our favor. When there isn't, and, and, and even, and even that's only individual cops. So one cop goes to court, and then right. the family gets a cup, some money, and then that, then the police continue to murder and beat as usual. Mm -hmm. So you know it's very difficult when we organize around a court strategy versus a class strategy. This is our economic power. We're going to shut it down. But you know, in Los Angeles, it's very, it's very similar. Very, it's very similar all around. People go to court, and then also they can, they tell the families to tell us to chill out because we're gonna mess yeah. up the case. So they get the families who are in grieving and they tell them, you know, isn't it so sad that people are breaking stuff because your family member died? And the families say, yeah, and then they say something on camera and then to discourage the movement and to kind of break them apart, when in reality it's the system. So that's an issue with the court, the legal system. You know, we have to kind of conceptualize ourselves as organizing outside of that, or that this legal system is against us, even if we win sometimes. Um, and then with connecting workers, black and white workers, you know, at my job, I have, conver we have conversations, you know, at work about different issues that are going on in addition to our particular economic things like caseload. So I'm a case manager, which is like a social worker. So, you know, we discuss our caseload, we discuss, you know, our, our bosses and different things like that. We also discuss politics. And it's something that, you know, I think all of us, when we think about our jobs, whether we're in unions or we're not in unions, that's something that we can continue to do to build that kind of trust and solidarity to have further impact down the line. <coughs> this, the, the, the immediacy is very important, but we ha I think it's important we start to have long-term strategies about how we're gonna take down this system. Um, not to say you, you weren't saying that, but I just wanna uh, point that out because the kind of damage that's been done, we're undoing it and we're taking it to the next level. So, um, and, my question is too, like, yeah. not gonna and one thing to thank you for the work that you've done in terms of organizing the union. Yeah, I, I have a couple sure quick answers that. too. Uh, one thing the league did, or the aftermath of the league, was to uh, try and gain control of the criminal court judgeships. Mm -hmm. uh, and they could win those elections. They didn't like going to elections unless you could win. And if you don't run for president, governor, and so forth, and look, feel good. But run for an office, you can win. And you can win in Detroit in criminal court. And you get a judge up there, at least at one level of cases, where you get a little bit of justice. And they were able to do that uh, and change the nature of the, of the court. In fact, a couple of the league members ended up being in the criminal court judges. And for a while, things got better. Uh, to your first question, though, uh, when we talk about uh, targeting, um, uh, I'm involved with the general strike myself, but we also have to can't, you can target. The League saw, and I don't know how many of you know this, the Eldon Avenue gear and axle plant. Have you ever heard of the gear? No. It is the only axle plant in the Chrysler Empire. Mm. So if the black workers, which are the majority, at Eldon Avenue Gear and Axle can be organized and go on strike, Chrysler is shut down nationally. Yeah. So it took some, you know, that you don't learn that every day. You have to, <laughs> your organization has to know that. They, and they tried, and they didn't succeed. They were fought tooth and nail, of course, but at least that was the target they took. Um, the other thing which we don't see much of, one of the new techniques for, for capitalism is uh, <coughs> point of production, where all the little pieces arrive at the same time. That's a very vulnerable system. Uh, and I, don't, I haven't read many strategies of how you screw up their point of production. So, oh, the tires came, et cetera, came. oh, wait a minute, <laughs> there are no doors, you know. Uh, and I, don't, I haven't seen strategy ab about that. And again, that's a case where a limited number of, of well-placed workers can do a lot of damage.
and be very effective. Let me just you, toss you right here, and then um, and then you, and then I see you, and you. Oh, you, 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 of course. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, you, and then I'm gonna. Uh, right. Well, the greatest limitation was they didn't uh, mobilize women well. Uh, they're, they're and all the veterans, <laughs> are the, are, are, are the very, they're the very first to admit it. Uh, it wasn't they were worse than anybody else, but they were like everybody else worse. In all these other areas, they'd broken through. That doesn't mean there weren't some women with power, but you know, it, there was, it, was, it's, it, was, it was a problem. Uh, the biggest, uh, and maybe I'm betraying my own political views. Uh, the uh, bookstore uh, created uh, in alliance with the League was called From the Ground Up. And I think what you can learn from the League and others is from the ground up. If the power is concentrated uh, at the base, you listen to the base, and you grow up, you're going to be very, very difficult. Whereas I think so much of the rest of the stuff is people at the top coming down and telling these people what to do. Now, it has to be education, so there's a role for the top, as it were. But listening, as, as a male it takes a while to learn that, uh, <laughs> l listening is very important. <laughs> and uh, listening to your base, I think, is, is, is critical. Um, who was it? All the you were you had your hand up. You had your hand up. You and you. Okay. So I got one, two, three, four. Next. You're next. You're up. You're up. Next. Um, <laughs> orientation, the rank and file orientation, the perspective that if um, whatever happens at the top of their group, if they can organize on the ground and can change things, is what uh, people were guided by and uh, in, the mo in the most dynamic uh, orga organizing that's going on uh, in the Uh, the political issues. 
and that has been the dismal failure of the uh, Levy bureaucracy mm -hmm. uh, going forward, and uh, it is the opportunity that we have to uh, move from there. Um, just in terms of how dangerous that was, that 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 actually is, in terms of the system. It's often people speculate about the assassination of Dr. King and talk about it was, and, and the domestic, domestic strife and the important uh, dynamic in that. But it was also um, never, these people were never played, and it's, ne it's never talked about that Dr. King actually got assassinated at a couple of weeks General strike yeah, yeah. for those. Absolutely. You know, that was um, that was uh, an important thing. So we have a great deal of work to do. But <laughs> you have to keep in mind that it starts on the ground, and you have to actually do things. You have to you have to actually organize the rebellion that you want to be. You know, the insurrection that you. Uh, Okay, I see you, you, and yourself in the back. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm Dan, and excuse me, uh, I'm working in, in a group, uh, Workers' Power. Um, I just wanted to touch on two points. Uh, I want to go back to the, I guess that was one of the starting issues that we're talking about, shutting it down and, you know, black slave class struggle. Um, I kind of wanted to, like, touch on, you know, where these struggles I see you, and I see you, okay? Yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, uh, I also work in the labor, I work in the labor movement, which is constrained at times, but also I agree with what you said about, uh, it's not a model, it's a concept <laughs> of workers coming together, and they can do what we shape us to be, so I think, you know, I do think it needs to be 
really at the sort of forefront of any effort to transform our economy. So I'm trying to lean into the earthy to be at the forefront of that. Um, but I'm curious, maybe maybe Ben, you could speak to this, I'm not sure, the ways in which the labor bureaucracy, right, reinforces, um, in a way, what you talked about with black leadership in political parties, like, it's not quite the same, but I feel like within the labor movement, in, in the case I work at, in the retail workers union, you know, you have largely white leadership, largely people of color, rank and file. So sort of speaking to that tension, I think, and I think that, you know, there's, and, and that in the context of a very weak labor movement, that is sort of the density is so low that, you know, the leadership feels so threatened, not just by what's happening externally, but by their own base. They don't want to educate their base. And this comes back to your question. There's no incentive to have a sort of mobilized base. It's terrifying to the leadership um, because they just feel so so weak and they can't. So And so they direct their resources to trying to influence the Democratic Party as opposed to trying to actually, you know, uh, rest sort of uh, agitate the, the sort of power within the base that can actually speak to the issues of police brutality. I mean, this is happening in people's communities, right? They're dealing with gentrification in a very real way. They're dealing with police brutality. Um, and there's such obvious spaces for synergy and intersection between these struggles, between the worker struggles and the community struggles. Um, and it just it could so easily happen for us there. And it's just not. Um, but I just was sort of scratching the from there. I'm just curious what you think about that. Do you want to wait? I, I want to have you actually do the last question. So maybe she, she could ask her question. Yes, you're, you you oh. you would be the last if that uh, unless people have a pressing one. Uh, but to, so then we could all speak to some of the other comments that have been made. Okay. Is that all right with people? Cool. Please. Um, Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, we're, Malcolm X said, and his birthday was 19, uh, you know, that we're taught in this society that our friends are our enemies, our enemies are our friends, and we're taught to, to hate the people who are actually on our side. So I, I, you know, I myself, and he also said that we all come from somewhere in terms of our consciousness. You know, he, he did, he came from somewhere. We all, politically evolved. And I think that more people, there's the fact that someone is called a socialist, openly calling themselves one versus Obama being called a socialist as a slur in 2008. <laughs> um, now someone is like, I am a socialist. Now I would debate whether he was or what that is and yeah. other things. But I think that someone who is calling themselves a socialist and that it's being talked about is kind of showing that people can change. And now they're not all the way there, that's absolutely true. But it's an opportunity for those of us who are socialists or communists to kind of engage people about what that means and how are we gonna achieve it, you know? Um, I think I wanted to kind of also mention someone who's very influential to me personally. He's a black Trotskyist, they call him Lil Joe. Um, and he's in LA. In Los Angeles, every month there's a Black Panther breakfast. Uh, once a month, where a lot of the Elder Panthers get together and they eat, socialize, but they also discuss political events. And I think that this kind of way, these folks that have done so much, risk their lives. I mean, the United States went all out war against these revolutionaries, they have something to offer to us. Elders have something to offer to us. And I think that for younger revolutionaries, we should talk to elders and engage them. And I think elders got to listen. I was talking to him and I was talking about women and like, you know, 
either folks step up and learn about patriarchy and different things like that, or a lot of young people are just gonna not even come around. They're not even gonna argue with them. They're just gonna disappear. So, um, you know, it's important that people, revolutionaries, young and old, evolve and learn together, um, especially the ones that they haven't killed or are isolated from us. There's a reason why they did that. There's a reason why they locked those people up in jail, so that they couldn't influence the youth. Um, now they're the grandchildren. We're the grandchildren, um, and you know, the people who we can, we should still learn. We have to learn from them as much as we can. Um, uh, and you said the union bureaucracy. The union bureaucracy is all is completely connected and tied to imperialism, and they have to be taken down. We can't convince them. Um, the AFL CFO has been so bad that they've actually funded other imperialist conquests in other countries, particularly in Latin America. So reactionary. And yet, the members, us, myself, many of us, how, how many people are in unions? Okay, so these are the, a good amount of people in this room right now, we are in unions. And believe it, they are going to start making us try to pound the pavement so that we can get some Democrat elected. <laughs> yes, they will. They will give us flyers. They will tell you the stickers, the packs, the poli what all that crap. Like, what if we started talking at our union meetings, if we have <coughs> union meetings, and started kind of pushing back on that, or just talking to our other union members about that? What could that mean? What could that mean in four years? You know, or if what could that in the next election cycle? What could that mean? So we kind of have to think of ourselves like when we leave this place, the left forum, where many people are sympathetic to socialism, uh, <laughs> you know, how are we going to influence our workplaces? How are we going to influence our unions? I'm actually shocked that so many people are union members. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess a couple things it's to fine. what you asked. You know, there's a couple concepts, one called business unionism mm -hmm. and another social justice unionism. AFL-CIO long ago purged out so many people and has accepted this idea of business unionism where we're just going to fight for our own individual union worker, like better pay, mm -hmm. benefits, and that's, that's the direction they've gone. Mm -hmm. Instead of more social justice, it looks at larger issues of anything from anti-war to reproductive rights to police brutality, and that's how you would actually connect, make connections between these issues and connect to communities where you have community and worker you know, because people, they leave their job when they have these other issues that are going on. You know, people are getting, you know, a black person leaves a job, the police, gentrification, housing problems. What is the union, is the union helping me with that? Are they doing anything? Generally, no. Um, so that, that's the one issue. And then like the other issue that you talked about with the leadership is white, male, predominantly, slightly changing a little bit in AFL-CIO. It's getting much. Mm -hmm. And you have this population that's black and brown, and you know, it's interesting, the, most, the group of people who's most likely to want and to join a union now is black women. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that leadership no. reflected mm -hmm. at all, and that's a long going issue, even in the AFL, when it was the AFL, is you know, outright exclusion of people and segregated unions themselves as a whole. And so the issue of like the racism within the union movement and the, especially the building trades, mm -hmm. which is terrible still, is still like the major issue that has to be dealt with. Uh, and I think part of it is kind of dealing with the idea of like pushing social justice unionism, as people call it, is how do we make those connections between the issues that people face once they leave their job and the community and, and, and the town. And I think that has to be a, not a good, I don't think the AFL CIO did that change. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think also the, the point she raised about socialism, actually what I, I was, I didn't vote for Sanders, I'm not gonna vote for Sanders. His foreign policy to me is just too, like she mentioned, is just too imperialistic. Uh, drones that are being done by a socialist president don't do anything different <laughs> than a capitalist <laughs> president. So if you support drones like Sanders, I can't, you know, and other things I can't get with. But the good part about it is, is that the idea of socialism and it, the fact that so many people weren't scared. You said they were, but actually so many people supported him and came out. And it shows that people are really looking for something new and they want something new. And this generation, people who are probably like my age, born after like 1980 or so, even a little older than that, a few years, you know, they're not scared of the word socialism. That, that Cold War anti-communism isn't as strong and it's worn off to an extent. It's still there. 
But it shows, that's what I liked about the campaign, and what I had really found most, you know, proud about it, was the fact that for the first, in the United States, there was someone who actually challenged and for like this, this part that was calling himself a socialist. Now, whether he really was, I was calling him a social democrat, but that's, you know, that's a whole nother debate. That's what he says he is. That's what he says he is. But he says, he says he's a socialist. He says social democrat. He says a democratic socialist. He says democratic socialist. So he calls himself a socialist. Anyway, yeah, that's, that's, that's another debate. That's what he says. Yeah. Right, right. But, yeah, so, I mean, I, to me, like, the whole case, his, his, his sort of Bernie Sanders is really shows that people are looking for something different. They're not scared. Young people are not scared of the word socialism anymore. You can't throw that boogeyman out there right. in the same way anymore. Well, I, mean, I was sort of <coughs> going to say the same thing to some degree. Uh, <coughs> I accept Bernie Sanders for what he says he is. He's a democratic socialist. If he was in Europe, he'd be in one of the mainstream parties because those are the ruling parties. You know, what's he want? Free education. Greece has that. Mm -hmm. uh, free public uh, health, et cetera, et cetera. These are all modest demands. So I think what's really interesting is he's taken these modest demands and knocked them into the wall of capitalism. And more than 9 million Americans have voted for him. That means there is a base upon which we can organize. Absolutely. We're not going to get 9 million. 100,000 will today. do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Those Newport Council ones, they couldn't vote. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of uh, <clears throat> labels, too, uh, I guess because I'm an elder here. Uh, not only do I remember when socialism got you kicked out of your job, uh, yeah. or, or I, when I entered Wayne State University, the last socialist club was kicked out for being un-American. Uh, for years, to be a liberal was a horrible thing. You're like, oh, a liberal, ah, ah, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> From their perspective. Uh, and so I think the fact that he's legitimatized socialism, people say, well, what the hell is this anyhow? The door is open. Yeah. Yeah. And we can go through and take, a, take advantage of the open window, or slowly it'll close again, and the Democratic Party will they, stick around. But capitalism creates the conditions for revolution. Oh, yeah. They can't help it. <laughs> they can't help but exploit us. You know, they, they can't. They, they can't help themselves. And uh, one po point I wanted to make that you had mentioned uh, that I want to raise and then maybe we can close out was the Port of Oakland actually got shut down yes. around Oscar Grant and yeah. then it got shut down again around yeah. Occupy and that repression. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's, that was only a few years ago. That wasn't even five years ago. Um, and, and that was huge. And then I was part of the organizing when we tried to shut down the ports of Los Angeles, Oakland, and in Seattle. So people are consciously targeting these places of power. And again, that's up to us as revolutionaries to be investigating what is a place of power? What's a place of power in New York? Where are the places of power in Los Angeles? Where are the places of po power in Philly, uh, DC? What, where's the work? Where are the workers? What are they doing? How can we also discuss with them? You were saying, you know, a minority of workers can do a lot of damage if they're strategically organize in a certain place. These ports, so many of us who are in these port cities, you know, we could be discussing that. There's all kinds of strategies that we can make, but we have to start to strategize, you know, this kind of reactive stuff that they got us on. It makes it very difficult to make a plan about, okay, what are we gonna do in 10 years when right now they're doing this and we have to do this and da da da. There is time for spontaneity, but we have to begin to make a plan and make a plan against capitalism. Not just, a, not just a few reforms, not get rid of a few evil ass cops because the evil cops are also backed up by the quiet ones that say nothing, that know what's going on. Um, then this whole system's wrong anyway. And I, I just also um, wanna conclude by saying that like, we really can win. Like we actually can win. Not just fight, not make a stand, not speak truth to power, take power away from them and empower the rest of this world. And I just wanted to thank all of you for our speakers and I wanna thank all of you for fighting against this powerful capitalist system and I encourage you to do that. Contact us, contact other organizations. History is ours, so thank you so much. Thank you.